Hi there and welcome. Jonathan here. These talks are offered freely so that no one is ever denied access to these practices. Your support makes a big difference. If you feel inspired to make a donation, please go to jonathanfaust.com. Thank you. Did you notice when I said, and now let your awareness come back to sound, that the motorcycle? <laughs> I had a little earpiece. I said, okay, cue the motorcycle. Here we go. <laughs> it was also interesting because the whole thing of being, you know, equanimous with sound. I, I've, I've had a motorcycle since I was 15. I finally gave it up when I moved down to D.C., but I have my own thing about loud motorcycles. They really annoy me. So I got to watch my mind, you know, you bastard. I see what's going by. <laughs> aversion attraction, aversion attraction. That's pretty much the name of the game. So there's a saying that the, the most successful people in the world are the best communicators. And I think there's something to that. Um, and as we explore this topic of wise speech, I want to underscore it's really important not to rely on autocorrect on your devices when it comes to uh, wise speech. Uh, a couple examples I ran across. These are um, supposedly real. I mean, I got it from the internet. <laughs> <coughs> So these are some text messages back and forth. Person number one, you sound like you're in love. Number two, I'm crazy about him. He left an hour ago. <laughs> My whole bed smells of his colon and it makes me smile. <laughs> Person one, ew. Person two, cologne, I meant cologne. <laughs> Person number one, I took in the vampire diarrhea. <laughs> I, I took in the vampire diarrhea last night. <laughs> Person number two, what? <laughs> Person number one, I meant vampire diaries. <laughs> Jen and I are going skiing Saturday. Want to go? Feel free to inflate your girlfriend and bring her too. <laughs> I meant invite. This is, this is another good one. <clears throat> a friend was just diagnosed with rubber-made anthropods. <laughs> Where should I send her for more information? I meant rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> so we've been talking a little bit about the, the path that was outlined by the Buddha, the, <clears throat> the practices and the observances that are designed to help you become more free. The first is having a view, like getting a sense of, well, what's the map and where are the dead ends and where are the faster routes, having that sense of an overview. The second is to have, have a clear intention so you really know where, where you want to go and the quality of experience you want to have along the way. And we talked last, uh, last week about the, the intention of what's called renunciation, of like limiting your attraction to things, which is a, can be a challenge. The practice of being kind and the intention to do no harm. And this third, out, this third outline or the third offering is paying attention to your speech because that is a way you can do incredible harm or incredible, incredibly good, compassionate things through speech. It can be an amazing weapon, and it can be an amazing force of healing. And how you pay attention to your speech can make a huge, huge difference in your life. 
So I'd like to talk about the impact of wise speech, the criteria for wise speech, a model for wise speech that has saved my bacon over and over and over again, and, and really what's possible when you engage in the wise speech. So the impact of wise speech. When I was getting my master's degree, I got a free ticket to the, the NCTE conference in Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> the National Teachers, the National, the National Council of Teachers of English Convention. Really exciting event. But uh, my father was an English professor, and one of his colleagues was presenting at this conference. And, and I just happened to find him and another person from my dad's conference, and we were just, just had a really great chat, you know. And then later, um, this fellow told my father that this very esteemed colleague said to him, after our talk, that young man is going places. And I'm a little embarrassed to tell you how much of those words meant to me. But whenever I would be in, like, just be in doubt, you know, I was 21 years old when I met him, I would just remember, like, that young man is going places. It really made a difference. It was a powerful anchor for me of having someone seeing the good in me. And I would imagine there have been times in your life where you received some unexpected kindness or some appreciation or someone reflecting back your goodness and what a difference that can make in your life. It was Mark Twain who said, I can live for two months on a good compliment. And, and truly, I've, I've never quite forgotten that, that sort of unsolicited kindness, how much that affected me. And we can do that for each other. But of course, most of the time, we walk around in sort of a self-defended, self-protected field where we're scanning for danger, which is a good thing because it keeps us alive. But when we live in fear, even mild anxiety, we're contracted. And breaking out of that mold of contraction and opening up to a sense of our inner connectivity is a radical practice, a really radical practice. Marshall Rosenberg created this communication technique called nonviolent communication. It's quite powerful, and I'll share a little bit later about it. But he, he made this distinction between what he called giraffe language and jackal language. The, the giraffe has the biggest heart of all the mammals. And we can, we can act from our heart, or we can act from the jackal, which is kind of low to the ground and fearful and opportunistic. And in many ways, those two qualities are in us all the time. Our capacity for kindness, for extending ourselves out to other, for cultivating empathy, and our capacity to be fearful and self-protective. Paying attention to that can make a really, really big difference. So consciously bringing compassion into your language is not easy, but it can make a big difference. I realized recently that I spend at least one month a year either in silence or supporting people in silence. When I'm on, on a personal retreat or when I'm um, directing retreats, and it's quite profound to, to have that regular time of being in silence and just seeing the conversation that's always going on inside and supporting others through that practice of restraining from speech and then how dramatically it can bring up more of an awareness of the conversation that's going on all the time. And for many people, they notice that that tendency for judgment and comparison that we express outward is really just a reflection of how judgmental we are of ourselves. 
So there are some criteria through this lens of Buddhist philosophy or Buddhist psychology, if you will, that the Buddha outlined pretty clearly with many, many rules around how to use speech. Because in the Buddha's time, he inspired lots of people to practice. So there were communities that were dedicated to practice, you know. And these communities were filled with unenlightened people, as well-intentioned as they were. So in order to cultivate harmony in these very intensive communities with people living very, very close to each other, there were many, many guidelines around what not to talk about, what you could talk about. And the lists go on and on and on. It's really quite, it's really quite interesting. But when you're, when you're among people who are not fully awake, it means that there are three factors that are running through any community. And one of them is greed, that is the desire for more. And one is hatred, that aversion, judgment, blame. And the third element is delusion, just sort of the confusion, believing things are true that are not true. One line from the Buddha, he said, better than a thousand meaningless statements is one meaningful word which, having been heard, brings peace. And as a teacher once said, if you can't control your mouth, there's no way you can hope to control your mind. And really, that's why awareness of speech is so important. There's a great acronym of WAIT, W-A-I-T. Why am I talking? <laughs> So chances are you were told um, count to ten before you say something mad. Um, a big thing in my culture was if you don't have anything positive to say, don't say anything at all. That's got a shadow side to it, but there is an element in there. And one of the things my, uh, my teacher's teacher would say is consider the next thing you're about to say and ask yourself, if it is an improvement on silence. That usually slows me down. So here are some qualities of wise speech. One is to make sure that what you're about to say is well intended. And you can ask yourself, what is my intention in what I'm about to say? Like, what am I hoping to will be the result out of this communication? The second element is around truth. And you can ask yourself, is what I'm about to say true? The third element that the Buddha spoke of is around asking yourself, is what I'm about to say beneficial? Is what I'm about to say going to add something? The fourth is what I'm about to say timely. Is this the right time? And the final is to ask yourself, is what I'm about to say kind? So I always had some trouble with that. How do you be truthful and be kind at the same time? Initially, I thought they're mutually exclusive. But when you really pay attention, I think it's quite possible. And there's a formula uh, I'll share with you, which can be quite powerful for helping you do that, although you really have to dig, I find, particularly when you're activated. So a little bit about Marshall Rosenberg. A uh, very, very interesting guy. Uh, he, he grew up, I think, in Detroit. He was the only Jewish family. He got beat up a lot. And he went on to study psychology because he was quite fascinated with why are people so mean to each other. And he developed a beautiful model for communication. 
So this is something that I just took from an interview with him where he was describing a little bit about how he would work with people. And he was really quite well known for going into the worst conflict zones you can imagine and setting up opposing parties to have a conversation. So here's what he said. About eight years ago, I was mediating between a Muslim tribe and a Christian tribe in northern Nigeria. In their conflict, a quarter of the population had been killed. At that time, they were fighting about how many places in the marketplace each side would have to display their products. I started the reconciliation process with them by saying that I was confident that if we could hear each other's needs, we could find a way to get everybody's needs met. Inviting whoever wanted to start, I asked, what needs of yours are not getting met? The chief from the Christian tribe screamed, you people are murderers. Now notice that when I asked him what needs weren't getting met, his response was to tell me what was wrong with the other side. This provoked a counterjudgment. Someone on the Muslim side screamed back, you've been trying to dominate us and we're not going to tolerate it anymore. Because this training is based on the assumption that all violent language is a tragic expression of unmet needs, when the chiefs finished screaming, my job was to translate the enemy image of the murderer into a language describing the needs of the person who screamed. I said, Chief, are you saying that your need for safety is not being met and you want some agreement that no matter what the conflict, that it will be resolved some way other than violence? He looked shocked for a moment because this is different than people are trained to think. And then he said, that is exactly right. By getting the chief to acknowledge his need wasn't being met, I had to get the Muslim side to see through their enemy image. And I said, would somebody on the other side please tell me what you heard the chief say his needs were? A gentleman from the Muslim tribe screamed back, then why did you kill my son? In fact, there were several others in the Muslim tribe who knew that someone present had killed one of their children. So there were a lot of feelings. The Muslim tri tribe had to put down their rage long enough to hear the needs of the Christian tribe. And that was not easy. I had to give them some empathy before they could do that. But finally, I got them to hear just one simple thing, that the Christian tribe had said they had a need for safety. It took me about an hour and a half to get both sides to release the enemy image long enough to hear a need from the other side. At that point, one of the chiefs came up to me and said, if we know how to communicate this way, we don't have to kill each other. Another example, a group of Israelis and Palestinians on the West Bank were hoping to be able to work toward peace in that area. I asked, what is it you want from each other that would make it easier for you to work together? The Palestinian mayor, mayor of the village responded by telling the Israelis, you people are a bunch of Nazis. Predictably, one of the Israelis fired back. That was totally insensitive for you to say. So instead of peace and harmony, they were creating violence and hostility. I helped them translate their judgments into what it was that they were wanting from one another. When you get people to talk about what they want from each other instead of what's wrong with each other, there's always a possibility for reconciliation to begin. As I explore these principles of nonviolent communication, one of the things I, I love about this is, is in all the greatest teachings, they're really, really simple. And there, there are four inquiries, as I see it. Whenever you are in conflict with someone, there are four questions you have to ask yourself, and you have to be brutally honest. And we'll do a little exercise if you'd like to try this on. The first is, you have to ask yourself, 
what happened? But here's the caveat. What happened that we both agree happened? So by asking that question, by drilling into that question, it forces you to begin a role reverse. What do you both agree happened? The second question you have to ask yourself is, what do I feel? What are the, what are the feeling words that arise out of that? And that takes courage because that moves you from blame to taking responsibility for your experience. And as I think I've mentioned before, the answer is not, I feel you're an idiot. They're actually, they're <laughs> it's the feeling words. Now, one of the real keys in here is whenever there is a conflict, there's always an unmet need. And the, the third question is, what were you wanting? What were you hoping for that didn't happen? And again, I found it takes real courage to move from, external, from the external blame you put on another to take ownership for what is that unmet need? Can you articulate that? And the fourth is, what is a life-affirming request? And what, what that is not is, my request is you never do that again. It's something the other person, they have refusal rights, but quite often that is, would you be willing to find a time to talk about this? Or would you be willing to tell me what it was like for you from your side? So I was once working with a couple and uh, we were discussing something and suddenly she just exploded. And she said, you never listen to me. You always jump over anything I say and try to control me. You are so self-centered. As you can imagine, that was not a great start to a conversation. The word always and never doesn't get you very far. So we had to break that down. What actually happened that they could both agree to? What was she actually feeling? What was she wanting? What was she needing? And so what it came down to was a statement that kind of went along these lines where she said, do you remember when I was talking about what I might do for my mother on her birthday? And you said I should just send her a card because she's been so mean to me. Well, when you said that, I felt frustrated and I felt angry. And I also kind of felt sad and helpless about our relationship. This has been a painful issue for me, and I really wanted to be able to talk it through and get some closure on it. And would you be willing to really sit down and talk this through with me? Very different conversation. And so her partner, when he heard that, Again, she named what was true. He agreed that's what happened. He got the depth of her feeling, which was not just anger, but sadness and hopelessness. And he got very clearly what she was wanting, which is the, which is the exact opposite of blame. And that began a conversation where they were, began to named their unmet needs, they began to be able to empathize with each other a little bit. So perhaps, if you like, we can just try this on in a short little meditation. If you can think of some relationship where you might have some frustration or a sense of separation, if you can't think of one, you can make one up just for the exercise. So if you like, you can close your eyes. And this will be just for a, a few minutes. You might just bring into mind, kind of go through the files. There's some relationship where you feel some frustration or some challenge or a sense of separation.
And I'll offer these questions and you can just take a, about a minute just to reflect on what naturally arises for you. You might visualize the, the point of conflict. You might sense what it feels like on the inside. And regarding this situation and this relationship, what happened that you would both agree happened? How would you describe that in a way the other would agree? And when you think about this situation, what do you feel? How many different emotions can you name that are related to this? It's always more than one. And regarding this situation, this relationship, what were you hoping for? What were you wanting that didn't happen? How would you describe that? And if you were to make a life-affirming request, what might you ask for, for them to find some time or to share their side? And now we'll do a little role reversal. Regarding the situation, what do you imagine the other person is feeling? How many emotions might you name on their side? And what do you imagine they were wanting? What do you imagine they were hoping for that didn't happen? And in your own way, you might just close this little practice by wishing, wishing this person well, as you would wish yourself well. And then if you like, you can let your eyes open, deepen your breath, or you can remain with them closed. I find these four inquiries to be incredibly challenging, but they cut right to the heart of things. Wherever there is conflict, if you can really drill down into that question, what do you both agree happened? That's huge. When you have the courage to really mine into the authentic emotions that arise out of that, that begins to take you into your own vulnerability and away from externalizing blame and judgment. And cutting to the unmet need is the opposite of blame. And as challenging as this model is, I, find, I have found it to be tremendously effective. And certainly, when, if you're with an intimate partner, when you follow this model, it will begin to develop a certain kind of confidence because you know that 
the sun is coming at you using this model, they've, they've done their homework. It's going to allow you to be a little more open, a little less defended. And in that same way, if you can drill through this, it will really assist you in being truthful and at the same time opening to a sense of vulnerability and kindness. When we are in fear, we contract, and we see everyone as the enemy. When that giraffe heart is flowing, when we, we're aware of our interconnectivity. And one of the most interesting elements of mindfulness practice that's being proven through functional MRIs and all kinds of brain studies is that as you become more self-aware, you automatically become more aware of what others are feeling. It's a fascinating, fascinating process. I, I, um, had, I had mentioned before, I took part in a, in a brain study through um, Harvard and Kripalu Center, if you're looking at one particular part of the brain, the, kind of the left part of the prefrontal cortex, for long-term meditators. And and they, what they found was that, for some reason, people who, uh, who have a long-term meditation practice have better facial recognition than other people. And part of it is that sense of being able to see who's out there more than just being kind of caught in that inner world and being able to empathize with people more. Just a natural byproduct of the practice. And you can, you can build that by consciously exploring the empathy practices. And I had shared before another big piece of, of nonviolent communication and one of the most profound ways that you can remove the detonator out of the bomb when you're in conflict are some very simple words. I imagine you're feeling dot, dot, dot. It's amazing how effective that can be. And it's a muscle that you can develop. And I, I've shared before how I got, was really into this while I was doing it all the time to the point of being maybe a little obnoxious. But, but even at Safeway with a checkout person, you know. <laughs> I imagine you're feeling tired at the end of the day. I said that once to a cashier, you know. I imagine you must be feeling tired at the end of the day. And she said, no, no, I'm going to a party and I'm really jazzed. And one thing that Marshall Rosenberg said, and I found it to be true, is, is when you practice that technique, it doesn't matter if you're wrong. It really doesn't matter if you're wrong. It's that willingness to imagine what another person is feeling. It's magical when someone feels that you're, you're offering empathy and extending yourself to them. And it is part of really opening to this truth of interconnectivity or this sense of, of interbeing that Thich Nhat Hanh talks about. A little quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, which you may be familiar with. <clears throat> he says, if you are a poet, you will see clearly that there is a cloud floating in the sheet of paper. Without a cloud, there will be no rain. Without rain, the trees cannot grow. And without trees, we cannot make paper. The cloud is essential for the paper to exist. If the cloud is not here, the sheet of paper cannot be here either. So we can say that the cloud and the paper are interbeing. And interbeing is a word that is not in the dictionary yet. But if we combine the prefix inter with the verb to be, we have a new word, interbe. Cultivating wise speech, cultivating harmlessness in speech, automatically begins to build a bridge between you and those around you. And by paying attention to what you say and to ask yourself those questions can be very, very helpful. to ask yourself, what is the deepest intention behind what I'm about to say? 
What is the result I'd like to engender by speaking right now? To ask yourself, is what I'm about to say true? Is what I'm about to say beneficial? Is what I'm about to say timely? And is what I'm about to say kind? Is truly the difference between doing harm and healing through your words. I just was talking with a good friend of mine this morning, and he was telling me about this uh, new kick that he's into. Um, it's uh, 21 days of no complaining. And you put a little rubber band on your left wrist, and every time you catch yourself complaining, you put it on the other wrist for a little while. And he said it's been extraordinary just to notice when his mind turns toward negativity. And after just a few days, just by eliminating the complaining, it's changed his whole perspective. You may know the story, I believe I shared of James Barras with his, with his mother. And I'll, I'll, I'll send you the YouTube link. Um, it's, she gave a little talk in this course called My Son Ruined My Life. And um, she was uh, very prone to complaining. And uh, it was toward the end of her life, he was hanging out with her, I think, for three weeks. And it was starting to drive him a little nuts. And he said, Mom, let's try a game. Every time you complain, let's add the words, and my life is so blessed. And so, so they did it as a game, you know? Like every time she started to say, uh, 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 and then she said, and my life is so blessed. And it really changed her, her, her whole attitude. And it's a very, very cute video. So I'll include that in the, in the email. So being aware of speech, being aware of the effect of your words, just being mindful of it can make a huge, huge difference. So I thought we'd close with a short meditation and a little reading that is quite powerful for exploring what it means to be in relationship with another. So if you like, you can close your eyes. We each have an immense capacity for intimacy. We each have this capacity for opening to our, our interconnectivity and the sense of interbeing, our shared experience. And this reading is rather long, but it's titled, It Doesn't Matter. It doesn't interest me what you do for a living. I want to know what you ache for and if you dare to dream of meeting your heart's longing. It doesn't interest me how old you are. I want to know if you will risk looking like a fool for love, for your dream, for the adventure of being alive. It doesn't interest me what planets are squaring your moon. I want to know if you have touched the center of your own sorrow, if you have been opened by life's betrayals or have become shriveled and clothed from fear of further pain. I want to know if you can sit with pain, mine or your own, without moving to hide it or fade it or fix it. I want to know if you can be with joy, mine or your own, if you can dance with wildness and let the ecstasy fill you to the tips of your fingers and toes without cautioning us to be careful, be realistic, 
remember the limitations of being human. It doesn't interest me if the story you are telling is true. I want to know if you can disappoint another to be true to yourself. If you can bear the accusation of betrayal and not betray your own soul. If you can be faithless and therefore trustworthy. I want to know if you can see beauty even when it is not pretty every day and if you can source your own life from its presence. I want to know if you can live with failure, yours and mine, and still stand at the edge of the lake and shout to the silver of the full moon, yes. It doesn't interest me to know where you live or how much money you have. I want to know if you can get up after the night of grief and despair, weary and bruised to the bone, and do what needs to be done to feed the children. It doesn't interest me who you know or how you came to be here. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. It doesn't interest me where or what or with whom you have studied. I want to know what sustains you from the inside when all else fell, falls away. I want to know if you can be alone with yourself and if you truly like the company you keep in the empty moments. In these final moments together, you might again open to the sounds around you, to the aliveness of breath, and to the quality of presence right now, right here. And as you're ready, you might deepen the breath. And in your own time, you can let your eyes open. Thank you for your kind attention. A couple of quick announcements. First, just to complete that onward with that poem, it doesn't interest me what time you need to be home. I want to know if you want a cookie. <laughs> They're out there. Next week, I am going to be away, uh, but we're going to have Hugh Byrne here. If you're not familiar with Hugh, he's one of the guiding teachers with IMCW. He just came out with a book um, on mindful habits. So if you're wanting to explore habit changing, he's going to be here next week, and there will be a book signing as well. So uh, I'm excited to have Hugh here. Uh, I think you'll enjoy him. Good man. If you'd like to be on the mailing list and you're not, please feel free to sign up in the back. Um, thank you, as always, for your support for the church and myself, and I will see you in two weeks. Thank you so much. Enjoy your night.